Hello everyone, I'm Women's Grandmaster Sabina Feuscher and we are here at the St. Louis Chess Club for the uh, Endgame X Club. And I'm going to continue the theme that I started last week with the Zugzwang, but we'll have some other positions that are not technically in the theme. Um, some of them might be familiar, so if they are, we're going to go a little bit faster over them. Um, if not, of course, we'll spend the time. So let's get started with the first position. Um, it's a bishop endgame. So as I was telling you last time, of course, uh, Zugzwang is typically prominent in king and pawn endgames, but it does work in other positions as well, including middle games. But now let's see a bishop endgame. So anyone familiar with this position? It should be pretty famous. So basically, typically in uh, bishop endgames, bishops of the same color, you always want to, to uh, look at your opponent's weaknesses, right? And in this case, black has three. So we have this pawn in the, oops, that should not happen. This pawn there, this one, and this one. So when there are three weaknesses, it is hard for the opponent to protect them all, right? The bishop can, a6 is a weakness too, but you cannot really attack it, so that's the reason why I did not uh, mention it. Uh, these three pawns, d5, f5, and h5, are all possible to be attacked by both the king. Well, this one can be attacked by the king, but all the other ones can be attacked by the bishop. This one in a6, I agree with you, it is a weakness, but unless you find a way for your bishop to teleport to b7 or c8, you cannot attack it, right? So we are going to focus on these three pawns. And basically in this position, if it would be black to move, black would have no move, no good move. Why? Yes? Exactly. So if he moves the bishop somewhere, he's going to lose one of these pawns. If he moves the king, well, the kings are in opposition and right now white might consider enter in c5 or e5 if you let. D5? No, because, I mean, if you would move, you would try to go, you know, maybe to c6, right? Okay, you're right. If he goes to e6, you could take the pawn. Okay. So, we are going to try with white to get this position with black to move. How do we do that? Well, where? Because your king cannot make any triangle here. Right? And if you move the king away from d4, then, uh, well, black will also be allowed to move his king. So you need to kind of lose a move, basically, with your bishop. The kings are not going to be moved. Bishop e2. Okay. What should black do here? Where should, on which diagonal should he move his bishop? six or bishop e8 right so let's just look if he goes bishop g6 what do you do now f1, f1. Yeah. and what's your idea go bishop so if you go bishop f1 here i will go bishop E8, no, because if I go bishop E8, you go bishop G2, you attack my pawn, I have to protect it, and then bishop F3, and it's over. We get this position, right? Which you have no moves, you're gonna, gonna lose a pawn. So uh, I'm going to go bishop F7 here. What do you do now? Bishop H6. Bishop H3. Okay, what is black doing? Bishop. How do I protect this pawn? I can protect it in e6 or g6. Okay. Bishop, bishop g2, bishop f7, bishop f3, right? And you're winning again. So then I go bishop e8. What do you do now? So bishop g6 is the only move. And then we do. Okay. Bishop G2. Okay. 
bishop g8. Bishop e6. Bishop f7. And you didn't manage to get me to be my turn. So you typically want to see which of the diagonals are the shortest. If you look here, right, there are three moves that you have on this diagonal. There are three moves that you have on this diagonal. But there are only two moves, for example, that you have on this diagonal to protect your pawn in f5. So if you somehow attract black on that diagonal, you're going to be able to give him the move. So if you go the first move, bishop e2, well, let's go back to the starting position. If you go bishop e2, black goes bishop e8, bishop d3, we attack this pawn. Now black has two moves, what are those moves? Bishop g6, d7. OK. Let's look at bishop d, uh, bishop d7 first. What do we do now? Bishop e2. Bishop e2, he goes back bishop e8. Bishop, 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 bishop c2 first. Because now, what do you want to do? Your next move is going to be bishop d1 to attack that pawn. If he's not paying care, uh, attention and he goes bishop c8, you go bishop d1 and he has no way to protect the pawn. You will win that pawn. So he needs to play bishop e6. And now what do you do? Bishop, bishop d1. You attack the pawn. You're forcing black to protect it. Bishop. And now you get bishop f3. And black is in Zugzwang. He has to give you one of the pawns. And then I'm assuming everyone here and the people who are watching are going to be able to win this with an extra pawn, right? OK, I hope so. OK, so let's go to see the other line. If after bishop e2, bishop e8, bishop d3, we go bishop g6 with black. We go on this other diagonal g6, h7, to protect that pawn. It's the same thing. Bishop c2, black has to wait on the diagonal, bishop h7, bishop, well, bishop d1 directly, then I go here. If you go f3, I go bishop f7. If you go bishop e2, I go bishop here. Bishop where? D3. It's the same position. So here, it was important to play bishop b3 first. You attract black on this diagonal. So when you attack this pawn h5, he has to go bishop f7, and then you get your bishop to f3. You are combining the attacks on all of these three pawns, and you're combining them on the diagonals where black only has two moves with the bishop. And this way, after bishop d1, bishop f7, bishop f3, we have got our Zugzwang once again. So I remember when I first started uh, this as a kid, it was, I was so impressed by this, because you can do this with the bishop. And uh, for some of you who are here, for some of the other hours that were taught by GM residents, I know they're focusing also on you know, the knight not being able to lose a move, but with the bishop you can do that. So that's the you know, cool thing about having bishops. But OK, knights are great as well. So are we going to do this position? Yes? Good. So let's go to the next position that I have. And this is a game that was played some time ago by a former world champion. Alexander Alekhine, and he has white here. And uh, if we were to evaluate this position, who would you say is better, or who should be winning? Yes? White, white of course. He has uh, an exchange up, and things seem to be going their way. But black does have some counterplay. These two pawns are. Um, past protected, 
right? And the king is not really in front of them to stop them. In this position, it is black to move, and Tartakover, who was playing black, played f3. Now, what is black's threat, and what should we do here in this position with white? E4. E4. Yes, of course, black wants to start pushing the pawns. So defending and then bringing the bishop, chase your rook away or push e3, you know, try to try to get the chance to to uh, improve the position of the pawns and get them towards promotion. So what should we do here with white? There's just one move that is winning here for white, sur surprisingly. No. <laughs> this is the only move that is winning for white, and let's see why. For example, if you go king c2, it, it's similar to king c4, uh, black pushes the pawn. Now what do you do? Rook d4 to try to get it? To win it? No? <laughs> and now e Yeah, now e3. Uh, f2 is actually not, not a good move. Why? Rook d1. And the rook stops your pawn. And then the king, well, if you push or not, the king will come to d3. Remember, if you have a bishop and two passed pawns, you always want to push your pawns on the same, I mean, on the, on the opposite color, no, on the opposite color than, than your bishop. Because if you push them on the same color and you have them like this, e3, f2, your opponent will be able to blockade them and you have no way to, to chase that piece away. That's why you want them to be on light square. Because if they are blocked, you have a check somehow to chase the king or rook away. But if you push f2, you, you messed up your pawns. But here, uh, it is e3, the black plays. And the problem is, how do you stop the pawns? Can you play rook e4? f2. What else can you do here? Can you play rook d1? And then? f2 or bishop g3 depends where I move my rook. And if I play king d3? e2. King d2. Bishop g3. Rook here, f2 loses. I take the pawn with the king, right? So what do you do here with black? King d7, um, can I play, for example, rook? No, I can't. Can I play g5? Hmm? You want, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, what do we do here with black? Bishop h4. And you're kind of in Zugzwang. You cannot push the g pawn. If you push b3, what do I do? What is my idea with bishop h4? Can't I just do check and come back? Uh, yeah. And your king cannot approach further the pawns and win them. That's the problem that you have. Can you, I don't know, like, OK, after bishop h4, can you play maybe rook here? No, f2, can't I, I take your pawn in e2. Bishop, where did you say? Bishop, uh, OK, and I cannot play rook f5. So that move didn't really help me very much. I can also not play rook e3, because I fall into some traps. And the problem is, with all this extra material, white cannot win. 
in this position. After you know, bishop g3, bishop h4, it's, uh, it's a draw, surprisingly. All of this because black has been able to push the pawns in the right way on the light square, so he's using the dark square to actually you know, annoy you and not be able to, to get close to his pawns. That's the reason why king c4 does not work. The other move that I had here is rook d1, which actually is a blunder. Can you find why? e4, and now you want to bring your king, right? King c2 to stop the pawn. The pawns, I'm sorry. e3, are you sure? Or, no, bishop f4 to stop Which one? Bishop f4 or e3? e3 it was, but I think if you play bishop f4, f1 or yeah, f1. But then how will my king? No, but if you do this, I can push e3. e2. I don't know. Yeah. But earlier in this position, if you play e3 immediately, king d3, e2, with tempo, where do I move my queen? Oh, somebody forgot their Facebook. OK. <laughs> so <laughs> OK, it was not mine. Um, e2. And now uh, what's, you know, what do you play here? Bishop f4 is my next move, and then f2. Well, f2 doesn't work. Yeah, it's probably the same. It's probably the same kind of thing. So in this position, rook d5 is a super, super awesome move. Wait. In this position, excuse me. Rook d5 is a super great move because now, you know, it seems kind of counterintuitive to place your rook in d5 when black is about to push the pawns. But the thing is, f2 is not really something that black wants to do. They don't want to place the pawns on dark square. We've already seen that, right? If you play f2. Rook comes back, you play e4, what do we play? King c2, let's say I play bishop f4, it's not really helping me very much, right. Rook f1, the king, if you don't push the e pawn, my king can come to e2, and, uh, and I'm winning. I've been able to blockade these two passed pawns, which are basically giving black the counterplay, um, so I blockaded them on black which is the same color as the bishop, and uh, that's the reason why we're winning, because they cannot push them for, uh, forward. So after rook d5, which is such a strong move, Tartakov went on to play e4. Now, what was the idea? Why do we need the rook in d5? And it was not good to have it in d1. The idea is that when our king will come to stop the pawns, we will have those squares free for our king. So in this position, rook f5. And if bishop g3, you can start pushing the pawn. But wait, I had another line, which doesn't appear here. Um, so what happens if black pushes e3? You take the pawn. Then I push e2. Oh, what did you say? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. And uh, e1 queen. Takes, takes. G6, you cannot stop the pawn, right? So black played king d7, g6. If instead of king d7, I push f2, what do you do here with white? g6. <laughs> you can go with the g pawn. But let's imagine you didn't have the pawn. Then you had the opportunity to play king c2 because, no? Because the king would come 
and blockade the pawn has been blockaded by itself on, on dark square. It cannot push forward. And if you stop the e pawn, then you're going to be able to win. So after king d7, g6, king e6, what do we do? Rook where? Rook f8. Which one would you play, rook f8 or g7? Which one? G7, take the rook, promote. Bishop f4. Oh, come on, we should be able to win this. How do we win this with white? H7, you mean? Certainly, that would work. Try to get that pawn and then, you know, everything. I mean, you have an extra queen and those pawns are not a threat for you. So you're going to be able to win. For example, check, check, which is how it followed in the game. Took that pawn, king g3, and now? Queen u1, f2? That's a way to blockade it. What if after queen u1 I go king g2? Ooh, please, don't play queen d2. <laughs> No. You can go back, queen e4. OK, you should not let that pawn go. In the game, uh, Alekhain played queen g6. The king has to go back to protect the bishop. Obviously, if you push the f pawn, your bishop will be lost. And then, you know, I can even sacrifice my queen on your pawn. I'll be able to win with three versus two here with your king outside. King there, he took some pawn in b6 and black resign. But the important thing in this position, which I liked and I thought it would go well with the theme, was the fact that rook d5 was the move in the position which kind of creates this zugzwang black really from the starting position. Black has no moves that would help him after rook d5. Has no moves that would help him, um, you know, balance his position, like, balance his pawns, like push them the way they want to, which is e4, e3, something like that. You don't manage to do it. Your pawns will be blockaded um, on dark square, so they will be on dark. And I'm not quite sure how it's, how it's better to say that they're blo blockaded on dark or white, but you understand what I'm saying. They would be on dark and you would be on light square, so hopefully it makes sense. Of course you can analyze it by yourself, and you should. Uh, knowing the classics is very important. Um, you, you learn a lot of ideas. Of course, there are, uh, on those times, because there are no computers, also, you know, you can find a lot of mistakes. But um, that's good if you can find mistakes, because, you know, it means you have dedicated time, analyzed and figured out, okay, this was a mistake, you know, I can improve, I can improve this, or, yeah. So some of the openings that were older, you know, uh, maybe didn't stay until nowadays, but uh, end games certainly are always great material to, to learn. It was here, yes. Here it was from the other, you're right, From I didn't mention that. Good point. <laughs> um, so yeah, here it was black that had the Zugzwang because you don't have a good move to, to, fo to win your, that F3 pawn. So um, your rook has to kind of stay stop bishop f4 if you would play something like, you know, uh, after, rook, after rook e4, you try to stop that. Um, putting the, the rook in e3 would lose the, the pawn, so good. So the next position is actually, ah, no, it's not that one yet. Okay, let's do this one. This is a little bit tricky, and uh, okay, there are some mistakes from both sides, and it's uh, more, more, uh, recent game. What do you guys think about this position? Yes? Yes? Draw. Draw, because you saw the result somewhere? No. OK. Why do you think this would end in a draw? Yes, bishop, rook versus rook should be a draw. Do you guys know how to draw that? Um, yeah. Last 
there was a class. Great. Okay. It's it's pretty you know you you always have to be careful you saw like uh, some people lost it some people I won once or twice uh, rook and bishop you have to be careful about the defense and you have to remember there's actually a Philidor position in that as well not the Philidor rook pawn versus rook but uh, rook bishop versus versus rook so you have to be careful uh, but um, in this position. Uh, yes, this, this should end in a draw, but it didn't, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, white went on to play king f1. What is the idea? What is he trying to do? Kind of make a fortress. So he's thinking, you know, if I keep my king here, f1, g2, and my rook on the f file, you'll never be able to trade a pawn, and it should be a draw. Right? Is that true? Can black have any chances to win this? Yes. How? Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. He said white yeah, they made a, they made some mistakes. If I'm not, if I remember correctly. So, g4, obviously taking here does not work. Did you guys calculate the king and pawn end games? End game, end game. Yes. Somebody can somebody tell me the line without moving the pieces? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. I didn't expect that, but uh, uh, how about G four here? King E two is a draw because you keep the opposition right. And what did you say? King F five, G four. Okay, that's nice. You can do that. Luckily for you. And if I play this, okay, you know it. Good job. Yeah, the pawn is on the fifth rank, so it doesn't help poor Black to win. Great. So Black has tried. He didn't want to accept a draw immediately. Uh, if you look at the, ra I mean, the ratings, Black is a twenty-five uh, hundred player, and white is 2350. So, you know, when you play against a lower rated player, you typically want to try to push as much as possible. You don't want to, to accept the draw too fast. At least I would not want, but uh, sometimes you can over push and lose, so you gotta be careful. You need to keep, you know, you need to play the position, not the rating of your opponent. That's, that's really important. And this is something that a lot of us don't do. We say it, you know, we, we, when we teach, we say that, but. Uh, when we play, we sometimes make the mistake of playing the rating, so your opponent. It's not the best thing to do. So black played g4 here, and now rook f4. Now, what is happening after king g2? What do you do now with white? And can I make any draw somehow? Can I save myself here? You sure? Okay. So, white has to do something here. So they play rook f4 check, try to switch to trade the f pawn for the g pawn. That's the only way that they can try to do something here. Otherwise, the king and pawn endgame is lost. If you move the king somewhere else, we'll still get that endgame. Right? So why didn't you play g4? Who didn't play g4? White? He played g4 here. So why didn't he play? I'm sorry? Why didn't he play? White played rook f4 check. So why didn't he play g4? Because we saw the king and pawn endgame was a draw. So with the pawn in g4, the king and pawn end game now is winning. If it's black to move, right? If white makes some random move, we just saw it, right? If you play king g2, we trade everything, and then king d3, and black is winning. Because the pawn is on the fourth rank instead of the fifth, once you come king f1, you know this? You sure? Don't seem so sure. So basically, like, um, you take the opposition, right? And the pawn is on the fourth rank. So black is winning anyways. 
Okay. So that's the reason why in this position, White said, okay, I cannot wait for the king and pawn endgame. I cannot allow it to happen. I need to do something. So he gave this check, king d3, and he took in g4. How can we try to create some winning chances for black? Rook takes f2, king e1. Rook f3. What's the idea? Very nice. So rook f3 is a very nice idea. You're threatening bishop c3 check, king goes to d1, rook f1 mate. Is this a Zugzwang position? Or does white have a solution, a defense? Rook to f4, check, king d1, rook e3. If you take the pawn, how? What, well, now you're getting kind of the Philidor position. So what should you do here with white to try to, to save yourself? You only have one move. Which one? Rook f2, rook g1. Yes, there is a way. So sometimes you put your rook in f2 and you have that check, but you only do that when, when actually the opponent doesn't have a mate on the last rank. You gotta be careful when you do it. Um, so you, put the, you have the rook in f2 and then you give that check and you, you cannot take it because it's stalemate and that's how you save yourself. But now you cannot do that because you're mate. So let's say I play rook, rook g8. Which one? Why don't you give a check just to make him go back, right? It's more active. I mean, you want some activity with your king. You give the check first to chase that king away, and then you, you play something like the rook on the third rank. Just don't get mated. So black is trying to win here. He played rook e3. So that was kind of a Zugzwang position earlier, by the way, here, right? But white had a safe, only move. OK, this, rook e3. What should white do in this position? Rook f1, only move. OK, is there any way we can put white in Zugzwang here? No. OK, so what do we do? And g1, too. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty hard. So black play bishop d4. It's giving you the move. And in this position, white play rook f2. He's waiting for bishop c3 back, but he cannot play rook d2 just yet. He still has a pawn on the board. The fact that the pawn is still on the board, it kind of helps black because you always have moves with the g pawn. So bishop c3, rook f1. Uh, I don't know why I had it with the dubious. That's a blunder, rook d2. OK, rook f1. And now uh, black play rook e5, rook f3, king there. OK, check, check. Try to win the, on the other side. And now white made a mistake. He gave this rook c8 check. You have to always try to give the right checks, and it's not so simple. But typically, um, it's on the side that you give most of the checks, and you try to make sure that uh, as you give the checks, you have the exit with your king. So if he hides behind the bishop, you can exit this way. But instead, white played rook c8 check. So he didn't actually lose because of. Uh, because he was lost. He lost because he made some mistakes. King d3, now what is black's threat? Pretty simple, rook a1. And now after check, what do we do? Bishop walks in front, bishop d4. Now we still have that threat. What should I do? Well, he has one more move to defend. Rook b8, what's happening here? Rook a1, rook b1. 
Bishop e3, king b2. Oh. Rook g2. And now you are kind of in Zugzwang. Why is white in Zugzwang? You're threatening mate, and because the rook is badly placed, you're threatening check, check, and rook b1, check. So if you try to escape that way, that's what happened to poor white. There are a lot of Zugzwang positions in rook bishop versus rook. In this case, white had an extra pawn, but he was unable to, to hold it because he didn't realize about this uh, idea. So if you ever play rook bishop versus rook, don't give up. Try to bring the opponent's king, you know, corner it or restrict it to the side, and then you know you'll have the ideas to, to to win. Like, don't give up. Okay, I think we still have time for. And now, although this is not part of what we should be doing, which is endgame exclam, I wanted to emphasize on the Zugzwang a little bit, uh, really fast for this position. Uh, do you know this one? Okay, so this is kind of, you know, uh, okay, so what is the move here after rook e1? What did black play? H6. H6. And I wanted to kind of, after h6, white has no moves. It's the middle of the game, but h6 basically stops everything. And what is black's threat? Rook f3 and just traps the queen. And white has no move, so that was just like a, Extra, extra stuff. Okay, now let's do some studies. Why to move? What is happening? I don't know. I mean, I can tell you the result, but. So, what do you think? Let's evaluate it and look. When you get the position, obviously, the first instinct is to ask whose turn it is and, and what is happening. But when you're playing, is anyone telling you what is happening? Obviously, they tell you whose turn it is because you already know. But nobody tells you what is happening. So you got to evaluate the position and figure out. Yes. OK, so how do you go for the draw? Do you guys know this? You know this one? OK. So what's the idea? What's the, f the idea of this position to make a draw? Uh, I think it's fork. Fork. At the end. No. Oh. Uh, how do you mean? Is that you want um, B2 by? B2. Okay. Queen. <laughs> yeah. King takes D5. B2. Bishop e5, can I promote? No, no, no. I'm pretty sure it's not a draw, queen versus two bishops, especially if I can win them. The idea is, I'll give you a hint of the idea. The idea is stalemate, actually. Yeah, so I'm, I'm combining Zugzwang with stalemate today, in this position. Zugzwang. <laughs> Bishop e5. I have to take. I don't know what's happening now. B2. Okay. So you take on d5. If I push, then you take. I promote whatever. Draw, <laughs> bishop. Okay. So, so let's see. Let's see some other moves. So, I've got king f5 and king f6. Let's see king f6. What's happening after this? King c4, then bishop here. This is pretty simple, right? How about if I move my bishop? King somewhere and, b and uh, bishop e4, okay? Mm -hmm. And last thing, if I play bishop f5, a uh, king f5, I'm sorry. Stalemate? How is the stalemate? Bishop c6, okay. And I play 
B2. Bishop B5, I promote. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. You have to promote to a queen if you make a rook. I'll give you check and take it, right? So. <laughs> well, if black promotes to a bishop, be sure you do not play bishop c2, okay? Because they can mate you with two bishops, okay? <laughs> and what do you do? You, two bishops versus a bishop should be a draw. Bishop c6? Okay, you can you can probably play that. Bishop somewhere. Just not c2. Anywhere. Just anywhere but c2. And when he... Yeah. If you're playing a blitz and you have the pre-move on your website, bad luck for you because... And actually, I remember I was, I was playing at some point. I started playing bullet, which I don't recommend, by the way. I'm I do not recommend bullets. Only when you want to have fun and relax for a little bit. And uh, I was so mad because I didn't win because I didn't have this promotion, so I would waste time to actually promote to a queen. So of course I made sure that I put my, um, I put it so that it always promotes to a queen. And then I played a game, and I I could not promote. I realized that if I promoted, it would be a stalemate. So yeah, I suffered there. So that was it. Hopefully you enjoyed today's class. We didn't go over all of them, but that's okay. We'll have some more for next time.